We welcome you to our service of worship on this beautiful, beautiful spring day. And we do ask that you would continue to uh, remember in prayer our members who are sick and not able to be with us today. We just mentioned one in passing, and that is Rusty. Rusty had fallen and has broken a portion of his hip, and he is undergoing surgery even as we speak right now in uh, Youngstown. There are other announcements for your perusal. They are especially referring to our young people with a youth Sunday coming up in May and then also summer camp. So please read those very, very carefully and give yourself to them as you are able. Let's come now to God with the call to worship. It's from Psalm 105. Let's stand. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, that the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we do thank you that we can seek you through the power of the Holy Spirit. We seek you through that one perfect mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to you today mindful that we are people who desperately needed salvation because we are sinners. We have fallen with Adam in his first transgression. We are utterly corrupted by sin in every part of our being. And so we come to you looking that you might show us anew your forgiving, pardoning grace. Hear us as we quietly confess our sins to you today. Our good and merciful God, we do ask that you would continue to remind us of your wondrous grace and mercy and that you might continue to apply those promises of forgiveness to our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might always lift up holy hands and give thanks for that salvation that has come from above in the person the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in this ever faithful Redeemer that we pray that prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, our worship team comes and leads us in a trio of selections.
to bow down. Here I am to say that you are my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. You may be seated. We look for our children to come forward at this time. Plenty of room up here. Come, there you go. Good to see you, children. What a wonderful, beautiful day it is to be in the Lord's house, to come and bow down and worship him. And I want to remind you today just of one person in the Old Testament. His name is Job. It's not Job. It's Job. And we read in the Old Testament um, that Job's wife said to him, so curse God and die. Job was a righteous man, a man who deeply loved God and sought to be faithful to God. But one day, Satan entered into the heavenly court, and he said to God, that Job, he only loves you because of the good gifts you give him. You take those away from him, and you'll see. Job will curse you to your face. God had confidence in his servant Job because he had given him grace and was preserving him. And so he said, have at it. You can't take his life, but you can bring trial into his life. And Satan did. Job got a report that his animals had been stolen by an invading army. And no sooner did that report come to him, another came and said that all of his children, all of them were in a house having a party and a great windstorm came and blew the house down on them. They all died. And then Job started to have sores break out on his head and all the way to his feet. They were painful sores. And yet he continued to serve God. And his wife at last said to him, why don't you just curse God and die? She was echoing Satan. And Job rebuked her and said, Shall we not receive good and evil from the Lord? You see, Job continued to press on in faith, trusting our God. And you know what, boys and girls? Job was a picture of Jesus. Jesus is that ultimate righteous sufferer. And Jesus' greatest suffering happened where? At the at the cross. You remember on the cross, Jesus uh, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Boys and girls, we're all going to have trials, difficulties, sicknesses. We're all going to have suffering. That's part of living in a fallen world. And the only way to go through that is by faith, persevering faith, by looking each day to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So remember, children, we must keep pressing forward, looking to whom? Jesus. Thank you, children. You said so well, and you can head back to your seats. And our young people, I just remind you of a verse from the book of Genesis where we read there that, and Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. You know, young people, it seems whenever we turn on the news today, we're always seeing stories and pictures of race riots in American cities. There are some who are saying that race relations in our nation are at their worst in 50 years. What are we as Christians to think and to say about such racial strife in our country? and in the world. Well, I only want to mention two things, and the first is the unity of this fallen world, the unity that we have in Adam. Adam named his wife Eve, which meant she was the mother of 
all living human beings. All of us sinned in, fell with Adam in his first transgression. And sin is now in the hearts of every single one of us. And it's that sin nature that leads us to think that those who look different than us, maybe a different skin color, whatever, that they are somehow inferior and we are superior to them. That is sin. That is sin, not only against our fellow image bearers, but even more, that is sin against the living God who created every one of us in his image and likeness. And so we have a unity in sin. That's the bad news. But the good news is the gospel. The good news of the gospel tells us Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to seek and to save them. And he didn't do so just for, quote, the Jews, but Jesus made it clear that he had sheep of another fold, Gentiles. And soon after his resurrection, Jesus would send his disciples out into the world to bear that message that Christ, the crucified and risen Redeemer, is the only Savior and we must put our hope, our trust in him. And we read in Revelation a picture of heaven in the seventh chapter. And guess who is standing around the throne, young people? God's elect people from every nation, every tribe, every language, every people. It's a wonderful testimony to the saving grace of God. He unites people in his son, Jesus Christ. And as we go forth and preach the gospel, we stand against racism because that's a denial of our unity in sin. And it is also a denial of our common need of that wonderful redeemer, the only mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as the church are called to be light in the darkness. And this is darkness in our nation today that we need to stand up against in and for the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel that Jesus has given us. And it's all about him. It's not about us. And we ask that you would give us courage and faithfulness, tenderness and love to speak the truth today. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Let's turn to our reading today from Psalms. It's Psalm 50. Excuse me. Psalm 18 has 50 verses. <laughs> Psalm 18. Let's hear the word of God. To the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of shield entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Thick clouds of dark with water. 
out of the brightness before him. Hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands he rewarded me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not done wickedly departed from my God for all his rules were before me and his statutes I did not put away from me I was blameless before him and I kept myself from my guilt so the Lord ha has rewarded me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight with the Merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord, and who is a rock except our God, the God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless? He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them and did not turn back till they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet, for you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, and those who hated me I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them as fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made uh, the head of nations whom I had not known serve me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lo lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued people under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. For this I praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for your word that you have given and preserved for us. We pray as Jesus did long ago, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Hear us, O Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 
Many years ago, the late Charles Colson penned a book entitled Kingdoms in Conflict. Within its pages, he told of two kingdoms in this world. There is the eternal, invisible, spiritual kingdom of God, and then all the human kingdoms. The human kingdoms are filled with restless, anxious men and women. They are always resisting, rebelling against that one true, unshakable kingdom of God. David was the earthly representative of that heavenly kingdom. He saw firsthand how the kingdoms of darkness that surrounded him were assaulting his kingdom. In this 18th Psalm, he rejoiced, though, that the kingdom of God was preserved and triumphed. This beautiful thanksgiving psalm is ultimately pointing us forward to the kingdom of Christ. And there we see the triumph of his everlasting kingdom of righteousness. And that's a reminder to us that we do not, we do not... Uh, are not on the losing side of history. We want to take that psalm up today by first noting a prayer in a time of distress. In some of our hymns, it's not unusual to hear the language of, I love you, Lord. We have that, for instance, in that older hymn from a number of decades ago, I love you, Lord, and I lift up my voice and worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Language like that, though, is exceedingly rare in the book of Psalms, Israel's praise manual. The love that's spoken is usually of God's love, his mercy that is extended to his covenant uh, people. But here in this 18th Psalm, we have their inverse. We have the psalmist's heartfelt love and commitment to God. And that is a commitment that was rooted in God's covenant. David could well remember how Samuel was uh, commissioned to go to Bethlehem, his hometown, and he was to come to the residence of Jesse and to anoint the next king who would rule over Israel. And one by one, Jesse's sons paraded by Samuel. There was Eliab, the firstborn, the one who had the wavy hair, the pepsodent smile. If there ever was a king in the making, that was it. That's how Samuel thought as he looked at the outward features, but it was God, the Holy Spirit, that reminded him that God doesn't look on the outward man, but he looks at the inward man, and all the sons went by, and none were chosen, and at last Samuel knew he wasn't sent on a fool's errand, and said, are there any others? And the father said, one more. And in came eventually the ruddiest and the youngest of all of Jesse's sons, David. David rejoiced that God had exalted him over all of his brothers and more, that God had made a covenant that he would build David a house, a dynasty that would endure forever. When you and I grasp something of the height, the depth of God's love for us, the response should be like David. It is that of lifting up our voice and singing God's praise. You know, this is how St. John reminds us in his first letter. He wrote, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Here in the opening verses, David's heart was captivated by the faithful love of God, that he lifted up his voice. And as you see here, all of these metaphors for God came rolling off his tongue. My rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, I, my refuge, my shield, horn, stronghold, all of them. We're accenting one, one essential point, that the living covenant God is sufficient. He is the sufficient one to always defend and deliver his people. And David knew that and was encouraging his heart on that at this moment because as verses 4 through 6 show, he was in a period of dire distress. One metaphor that he used to describe that was the torrents or the floods. 
Some of you might remember the tsunami that hit Thailand in 2004. It was a beautiful Sunday afternoon. The sun was shining, and there were thousands on the beach, most of them just lying on their towel and catching some rays, others throwing frisbees and hitting volleyballs around when suddenly people started to stand in mass and they looked at the sea, the surf had retreated from the shore and kept going out and out and out. And people are looking, what is going on here? They had never seen anything like that before. But a few knew what that phenomena was, and they screamed tsunami and started running. But most just had that deer in the headlights look when all of a sudden a massive wave now raced towards the shore and everyone who was still on the shore was swept up and away. That is the kind of imagery that David is using of his enemies, that they are coming to sweep him up and sweep him away. But notice how David responded in that moment of dire distress. David did not yield to fear and curl up in a ball, nor was he in a state of denial. As we see here in verse 6, he exercised faith. He called upon the name of the Lord. We read that this is our gracious covenant God who heard the psalmist from his holy temple. And dear friends, we as God's servants, his sons and daughters, will often be like David, exposed to the rising tide of ungodliness, threatening to undo us, threatening to sweep us up and away. And how are we to respond in those days? It is as the psalmist, with faith, by calling upon the name of our Lord. We see that, for instance, in the book of Hebrews. You remember the writer there said, let us therefore draw near with a true heart, full of assurance of faith. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. We need to get it ingrained in our minds that the one to whom we are calling is full of love and mercy. Our Father hears the cries of his children, and he has a deep and abiding love for them, and he is one who does answer prayer, as St. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 3, that he answers exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we think or ask. And now David has come. He has come to the throne of grace. And what was the answer? Well, we look at that. Secondly, this morning, in previous generations, it was not uncommon for the saints to keep prayer journals. Perhaps you've done so as well. In those prayer journals on one side of the page, you write down your request, the date when you started to pray for it. And then when God in his grace brings an answer, in the next adjacent column, you write down when that answer came, the circumstances. Those saints long ago who kept those journals did so for a reason. They wanted to encourage themselves that the living God not only hears, but he does answer the prayers of his people. And here in Psalm 18, David is giving us the stunning answer to his prayer. And we say stunning for a reason, because it leads off in verses 7 through 11 with a theophany, a theophany. We've used that word before. It simply means an appearance of God. It's a majestic appearance of God. And the theophany spelled out in these verses is an echo of what we find in, Gen in Exodus chapter 19. You remember the sovereign covenant God came down at Sinai. And when he descended, the mountain shook violently. Smoke billowed up from it like a furnace. The thunder was rumbling in the sky. Lightning was jagging across it. God on high was coming in his glory. And how did Israel respond? At the base of that mountain, at a distance far away, they trembled. This is the living God the Holy One coming to his people. 
And this is what David wants us to see, is the majesty of God to whom we pray. And notice that he went beyond God's appearance. In verses 12 through 15, he spoke of God's actions. The covenant God was portrayed as coming as a warrior. You'll notice a couple weapons, hailstones and coals of fire. The psalmist obviously remembered the days of Joshua. You remember when Joshua came into the land to conquer it for the glory of God? This was Israel's inheritance. We read that God sent down hailstones. Now, these were not the hailstones that we're typically used to seeing. You know, those little pellets. Once in a while, we'll see hail the size of golf balls and be stunned at that and think, well, the, it's damage it's doing to my car outside. These were not those hailstones. These were hailstones that were the size of folly balls weighing 100 pounds. There is no way the enemy soldiers could zig and zag, and their puny shields would do nothing when 100-pound hailstones are descending upon them. God pulverized the enemy. We read, too, how he harnessed the sea here. He opened it up. They saw the channels. It's a veiled reference to the Red Sea. As you remember, God brought his people through on dry ground. And then when the Egyptians, those persecutors, came after the apple of God's eye, what happened to them? The sea engulfed them. And it was they who sought to sweep away Israel, who are now swept away in the tide of God's wrath. And when he descended, what did he bring to psalmist? Well, the results of it are there in verses 16 and 19. We read of two of them. There was rescue. He rescued this trembling man from the floods. And secondly, he brought him to a broad place. Here is another allusion to the Exodus account. This time it's Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. There this language was used for the promised land. In other words, God long ago brought his people out of a narrow space of persecution and brought them into a bountiful and a broad place, the promised land. David was looking back and saying, what you did for Israel, your firstborn son, do for me. I'm your Davi, your beloved son. And that's exactly what God did. God's deliverance of Israel at then of David, it's been eclipsed in Jesus. Jesus was the one who went to the painful and shameful death of the cross. And prior to doing that, we read in Hebrews 5 that Jesus offered up loud prayers to him who could save him from death. And on the third day, God answered. There was that theophany of the earth shaking. The stone rolled back and emerging from that narrow space of death was the mighty Lord Jesus. He's the one who came forth and was lifted up to the true broad place, the right hand of the Father. And why did God do so? For Israel, for David, for his one and only beloved son. Because he loved him. Do you see, Christian, what you have in Christ? You and Christ are God's dear sons and daughters. Your prayers are not bouncing off the ceiling, but they're ascending up to the very throne of grace. And God hears. He sees us. He sees the trial that is before us today, the rising of ungodliness, the enemies of Christ in this culture. They are gaining in numbers and influence. They own the big tech industry. They are censoring and canceling people. They unfortunately own the corridors of power right now in government and, and elsewhere. And they are raging against believers in Christ. And why is that? Because they first raged against the Lord Jesus Christ. They hated him. 
And Jesus said, and they will hate you as well. It's because in Christ, we are lights shining in the world. We are shining forth with the gospel, which requires us to, first of all, give the bad news that we're all sinful, that we all are under the judgment and the wrath of God. But God be praised. He has sent into this world his only son, who took upon himself our sins, who suffered for those things, who died and was raised again from the dead. And though the world is raging at us, we don't need to uh, be filled with fear that we're going to be swept away in its torrent. What did Jesus say to us? In the Gospel of John, we read, Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid, but take courage. I have overcome the world. What encouragement that is for us, especially as we look at that last enemy, that enemy that is stalking each and every one of us, the enemy of death itself. We don't need to fear death or the judgment to come. And why is that? Because God's Son in our place was swept away in the tide of God's wrath. This is what he bore for our sake, that we might be delivered and rescued and brought into the true broad place, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of grace and mercy. This stunning answer led David to meditation here. And that was what we look at thirdly today, God's perfect way. Between verses 20 through 30, David took up the theme of God's goodness, his goodness seen in how he is faithful and merciful to deliver and rescue. How is this presented? Well, David's meditation occupies the first four verses, verses 20 through 24. And in it, once again, David says that he's a righteous man. And I'm reminding you, he is not a Pharisee, a self-congratulator, somebody applauding himself. He knew God's grace had reached down and lifted him up and exalted him, that he was a sinner saved by grace like you and me. He is giving thanks to God who has given him salvation and who has enabled him to live a faithful life. This psalm, as you noted, has a long superscription. In fact, that superscription is the longest in the entire book of Psalms. And it is important because it tells us when the psalm was written. And this psalm was written to express that moment when David came to the kingdom, how he had been delivered earlier from the lion, the bear, how he had been delivered from that menacing giant named Goliath, how the Lord had delivered him from the Philistines, and now he had delivered him from the hands of Saul, the raging king, and he had been brought to the throne. And David understood that on that throne, he needed to be a faithful king. He had to live faithfully according to the law of the king. It's spelled out in Deuteronomy 17. And we get a glimpse of his faithfulness in Psalm 101. Listen, every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. David understood that this theme of faithfulness, this faithfulness that he had, brought, uh, was emphasizing the faithfulness of God. God is faithful to his people. This is the principle laid out in verse 25. God will be faithful to those who are faithful to him. Do you see what he's showing us? God's faithfulness seen in protecting this man. And as we just illustrated, It had been there his entire life. This 18th Psalm was written before that time when David was unfaithful, when he had taken Bathsheba and arranged the death of her husband. 
This was at that earlier moment in his life. And look what he says in verse 29. For by you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. Do you see it? God had been faithful to him. And now God had equipped, sustained, and protected him. And as you think on that faithfulness of God to David, hopefully your mind is drifting forward in time to that true David, our Lord Jesus Christ. He was that faithful servant par excellence. And how do we see the faithfulness of God to Christ? We did a few weeks ago. You remember Psalm 16? The psalm that Peter quoted at Pentecost, Paul later in Acts 13, thy holy one will not see corruption. God had looked upon his son, Jesus, who lived that faithful life and lifted him up and gave him that throne of heaven. And now all of his and our enemies are being placed under the feet of Jesus. We have been united to this faithful servant, the Lord Jesus, and we are called to live lives of faithfulness. You and I can't do that in our flesh. And that's why it's imperative for us to remember the fruit of the Spirit. What's one of the last ones mentioned? Faithfulness. We're to be faithful, first and foremost, to our God who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are to be faithful to that identity that we have in Christ, to live as lights in a darkening world. We are to be faithful to our marriage vows. We are to be faithful to our membership vows. We are to be faithful in our workplace, working to honor our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be faithful children loving, serving, honoring our parents. We're to be faithful in every area of life to Christ. But as you think on that, you realize, I'm like David. There have been times when I've been unfaithful. And we all know it. And perhaps right now, you're in one of those spots. And you think upon that, it makes you cringe and you just feel like you're sinking into the dust. My dear friend, if that's the case, this is the time you need to preach the gospel to yourself again. The gospel shows us, yes, we are unfaithful servants, but Christ is faithful. And what are we called to do? We are called to come and confess our sins to him, knowing that he is Faithful and just, not only to forgive us our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, he is a faithful restorer of his people. But his faithfulness doesn't end in restoring us from our unfaithfulness. His faithfulness is to be seen yet to come. It is that body that we have today that one day will die and be placed in the ground and then on the day of his return, Christ will show his faithfulness by raising up those bodies and glorifying them. And there we will stand before his throne and we will rejoice that he has called us to reign with him over all of creation. He is faithful. Do you see how this meditation on God's perfect way, a way of love, a way of faithfulness, goodness, cheered his heart, but it also led him to think of victory. And we turn to that finally today from verses 30 through 46. The psalmist started to contemplate victory. And how? How does that present it? He present that. Well, at first, he wrote of God giving him feet like a deer, swift and agile. And further, that God had taught him to be a warrior. He gave him strength. Man, in the hunting season, you know you have to once again bulk up and get those muscles to pull back the bow. But have you ever imagined pulling a bow of bronze? Imagine the forearms, the lats, to be able to do that. This is what God enabled him to do. And afterwards, he tells us in verses 37 through 42, 
of the victory. He wounded his enemies so they could never lift up their fist again. Now, we would say today it was a rout. And verses 43 through 45 give us the results. David's kingdom was preserved. And what's more, his place of ruling over the nations was assured. This was an unparalleled victory that God had given this beloved son, this king. And how did David respond to such grace? In verses 46 through 50, he ends the psalm with doxology. Do you see how the psalm takes us back to the beginning? He opens with the praise of God, and now he's been lifted out of distress, delivered, established on a throne. He ends with the praise of our God. Now, how can we begin to apply that psalm to our lives? Well, it, re it has to start with a remembrance that David was God's anointed son. He was established, his throne here at this moment, we said, when Saul is put away, the way is clear now for David to arrive at the throne. His enemies have been put down, and David is singing praise in verse 49, because God will expand his kingdom. Did you note that? He established and he extended David's kingdom kingdom. His kingdom would continue to expand under his reign. We read in 2 Samuel 12, for instance, that David took the crown of a defeated king and put it on his head, showing supremacy over his enemies. And this kingdom of peace and righteousness, it extended even further in the days of Solomon. But after 40 years, Solomon passed, and with his death, the kingdom began to contract and decline. Do you realize then why this psalm is looking beyond David and Solomon? And to whom is it looking? To whom are all the psalms looking to? Jesus. How do we see Christ in this psalm? He's all over the psalm. But let me mention three ways quickly. And the first is you think of the beautiful metaphors that open the psalm. Rock, deliverer, shield, defense. Again, all of them show us that Christ is sufficient to deliver his people from whatever distress, whatever calamity is facing them. This week I was with one of our members praying with them and giving thanks how God had delivered them from a serious uh, procedure. It was a marvelous uh, testimony of God's grace that came from them. Or maybe God has delivered you from certain financial ruin. I knew of a woman whom God had delivered from war. She was a dear member in a previous church. She was born in the late 1930s in the Netherlands. And in the early 40s, the Nazis invaded her country. And where she lived in a rural area, they came in and they took all the cattle. They butchered them to feed their troops. And the people who lived in the area, they were getting by by eating tulip bulbs. And in that, those days of the Nazi nightmare, she said, I didn't see my father. I always was wondering, where's Papa? Five years later, the Allies came, and they defeated the Nazis and sent them scurrying back to Germany. And there was an impromptu parade, she said, and there leading the way were the Canadian, British, and American soldiers walking in full battle gear down the streets to the wild cheers and acclamation of the crowd. And coming behind them were the resistance fighters. And she stood on the sidewalk with her siblings, applauding and cheering, and she looked up. There was Papa. He was one of those brave resistance fighters. And they knew the victory did not come because of the allies, but it came from above. God had delivered. And further, we see Christ here. As the righteous king in verses 20 through 24, David's testimony. And as you think upon that, you realize, well, who is really the righteous king? 
who is the one who is without sin, who always did righteousness? And it is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is truly the faithful servant. He was faithful in a way that David never was. Jesus was faithful unto death, the death of the cross for us. A third way in which we see Christ here is in doxology, the final portion of the psalm, verses 46 through 49. Let me just highlight verse 49 itself. That verse was quoted by St. Paul in Romans chapter 15, verse 9. He showed that the prophecy of the Gentiles being drawn in has now come to pass in Jesus. You see, the gospel is going forth to the nations, and people are being drawn unto our wonderful king. This psalm assures us that the kingdom of Christ is established, and it is extending today, and the kingdom of Christ will fill the earth, that the kingdoms of this world, as we read in Revelation, will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And how, how ought we to live in light of that victory? Well, let me suggest to you two things today. I'm sure there are more. That's how wonderful the gospel is. But just two. And the first is with confidence. Confidence. It's not the secular confidence of trusting in myself, but it's a confidence in Christ because I know that Christ is Lord. He is the risen Lord who has defeated that final enemy for his people. And I know that the end is not opaque, it's not uncertain, and it's a chapter yet to be written. No. I know how the final chapter comes out. Christ prevails. What did we study in Revelation 19? Christ comes at last on that white horse, going forth to conquer, and he conquers all of the kingdoms, and all of these enemies will be placed under the feet of Jesus and under our feet as well, and on his head will be the crowns of all these worldlings because Christ is preeminent and thus you and I can live with confidence because we know how this will all come out in the end. The victory belongs to Jesus. God has established his kingdom. God is growing that kingdom day by day, hour by hour. Not only does it give us confidence, but joy, joy unspeakable, because we do know the outcome. And we know that when Christ does return, Satan will, and all of his minions will be cast into that fire of darkness. They will be thrust down there, and Christ will bring what? A new heavens and a new earth. And all of his saints from all of these nations will be brought into the presence of Christ. And there together, together we will lift up our voices and we will sing as we have never sung before, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord Jesus. You are my rock, my refuge, my deliverer, my fortress. You're my all-sufficient Savior. Your name together is altogether lovely, beautiful, and powerful. And that fills God's people with joy unspeakable. The issue today is this. Will you be in that choir? Will you be with those elect people who can lift up their voice and sing with joy. The way to be in that choir is by acknowledging that all of us have been part of the rebel kingdoms of this world. The kingdom's resisting. All of us have been little miniature lords setting ourselves up, living according to our own rules, for our own little fiefdoms, carving them out in this world to celebrate self. And we need to recognize that is rebellion and that Christ in his great kindness and mercy spread his arms on the cross and he died for rebels, rebels like you and me. 
and he sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts, as the psalmist said, and they will be willing in the day of his power, the day to confess Jesus as Lord. This is what we must do. We need to repent of our sins, put our faith in Christ and in Christ alone. And then you can be part of that wonderful choir, that beautiful people live in a fallen, dark world who love to praise the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for our marvelous Redeemer, and we ask that you would work in our hearts faith and repentance in his name. We ask these things in Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Amen and amen. At, at this time... Thank you. At this time, as soon as I get the bulletin here, we're going to be singing our offertory selection, He Will Hold Me Fast. Our ushers come forward at this time to receive our offerings. Remember, freely you have received, freely give.
opportunity to bring these gifts today. We pray that each and every Lord's Day that we do so with joy. The joy of our risen King, the one who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, whose kingdom is established, it is extending to all the earth. And we thank you that you made us part of that kingdom by your powerful grace and love. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would use both gift and giver for the sake of that kingdom. Hear us now, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we look to you for items to mention in prayer. Our ushers will come around with their microphones. I'll mention one as they're looking for people. And the first is to continue to pray for Rusty. Rusty is perhaps uh, is still in surgery as I speak. He had fallen in, I believe it's Thursday or Friday, and broke part of the hip. And so it's a very delicate procedure, and so we need to continue to pray for him. We may even hear before the end of the service how things went. So we'll see. Hi, this is Janet. <laughs> I just wanted to give a praise. Um, my mom was able to come home from the hospital on Sunday, and she's getting stronger every day. And um, I just want to thank the Lord for how he is in the details. We had to set up um, some home health and the particular company that she goes with in South Carolina wasn't able to do it here. Um, however, the one we were able to get with, um, the girl who came to be her physical therapist was the mom of one of my former kindergarten students mm. like 20 years ago, and happens to be Sherry Zaccoli's sister, Chris. Oh. <laughs> so it was really awesome to reconnect and also to have a Christian woman yeah. Yeah. Be with my mom. It was just really a, an awesome thing. So yeah. Amen. thank you, Lord, for the details. Amen. Details. Um, I have a, a, a praise and an announcement, and that is that, um, and ask for prayer. After two months of preparation, 23rd through 6th graders are now ready for the quizzing tournament that is next Saturday, held right here. And I would ask you to pray, um, not only because it's a, a special event, but the things that they have committed to their hearts and minds, that they are cemented there Amen. for decades to come. Amen. And so Bethel has invested very wisely, and I thank the session, and people who have given so that um, this ministry can continue in very difficult times. Thank you all so much, and please pray for the effectiveness of the ministry to Amen. continue. Amen. Uh, her healing progresses. Okay. What was that for again? My mother, Rose Gagliano. Okay. Thank you, Jim. This is Andrea. Um, yeah. We have prayed for George. I've asked for requests for a friend of mine that had um, uh, COVID, and he passed away this week. So please keep... Um, the family in your prayers, that he's with the Lord, they're rejoicing, but Amen. just for their grief at this time. Yeah. I have uh, an update uh, for, on Rusty from the live stream. Uh, he is out of surgery. He had three, put, three pins put in and is doing well. Praise the Lord. This is Colleen. I'd like to ask everyone for prayer. Um, Wednesday, I go in to have back surgery. Okay. Hi, 
this is Max Chatterley. I was patiently waiting for John Scott to stand up and say how happy he is to be married to Betty for 50 years. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> I'm sure you'll Sorry, hear John. about that later. <laughs> I couldn't be patient any longer, John. Yeah. <laughs> um, I <don't... laughs> Anyway, I also have a prayer concern. Um, I believe Mark Soley uh, has a uh, prayer for his friend um, a couple months ago, and Colleen Scott's cousin also happens to be uh, my niece, uh, Brenda Lockery. She had surgery uh, a couple months ago and um, quite extensive, and now has found that she has stage four cancer mm -hmm. and will be needing more surgery. Um, Brenda is local. She's just up the hill on West Fairview. Um, for those who know the family, that would be Pete's sister, Wanda. Wanda and John Lawrence are her parents, if you're trying to put it together, who that might be. Sure. But um, we ask for prayer for Brenda. Before the service, uh, I usually have a moment of prayer with one of our elders, and uh, one of the matters that Marat brought up in prayer today was praying for just the nations around the world. You and I, we have freedom right now to come to worship. How much longer we'll have that, that always remains to be seen in God's sovereignty. But there are other nations that don't have this. And my daughter and her family are experiencing this in China. This is the worst persecution that Chinese Christians have faced since the days of Mao Zedong. It is brutal that is taking place right now. And we need to pray for Christians in other places around the world that are having this type of persecution. Okay. Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the fact that we learned again today that you answer prayer. You lifted David out of his distress, and there are those who are in their own distress. We think of how you are the one who is all sufficient, Lord Jesus to deliver and defend your own. And we thank you for the good report that Russell has shared with about Rusty and his surgery. And we ask that you'd bring continued healing to this dear brother. We ask that you would also hear our prayers for Janet's mom and her release from the hospital. And how wonderful it was in the details uh, with Sherry's sister providing care. We ask that you would uh, bless our young people who are in Awana. We thank you that we have a very faithful, dedicated staff who persevered through this time and uh, remained open for a club. And we are so thankful for all these precious children. Bless them as they are in this quizzing and that you would help them to have this word sown deep in their hearts, as the psalmist said, so we might not sin against you, our God. We pray, Father, for Jim's uh, mom, who is with a broken pelvis and has other issues of being alone in the hospital. We ask that you would be with Rose, that you would bring healing, and that family members could get in to see, to encourage her. Lord Jesus, we do look to you, the one who brings healing to our souls, to bring healing here to Rose's body at this time. Father in heaven, we also pray for Andrea's, uh, this friend, this family that's a friend of Andrea, where they have seen a friend pass away who was sick with this COVID virus. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would comfort this family. We are thankful for the hope that he had in our risen Redeemer. Father, we also commend to you our dear sister Colleen as she's anticipating surgery this week that you would give the doctors wisdom and skill. Our Father, we pray to uh, for uh, Brenda as she is here dealing with uh, stage four cancer that you would uh, 
be with the family, and that they can bring the hope of the risen Christ, and that you would be pleased to bring healing, but above all, that you would remind us that even if we are not healed in this world, a greater healing is yet to come when our bodies will be raised up and made perfect like unto yours, Lord Jesus. Father, we give you thanks uh, for the institution of marriage that you brought to pass and how today um, we can ha celebrate with John and Betty their 50th anniversary. What a blessing. What a blessing. And we ask that you continue to watch over them and continue to use them in your kingdom. Our God, bless all the marriages that are represented here today. May they be encouraged by that, grow in their own love for one another. And Father, we pray for the nations. The nations are the inheritance of Jesus. And we pray that you would bless your church in times of persecution, in distress, when they feel like the flood is going to come and sweep them away. Help them to pray as the psalmist of old. Help them to look to Christ and be encouraged that his kingdom is established. His kingdom is growing. And it even grows in times of persecution and, in fact, often grows quicker and deeper in its relationship to Christ. We ask that you would bless your saints around the world and that you would bless us in this nation, that we would be bold witnesses, that we would not be cowered into silence, but we would speak the truth with love. For we ask these things through our blessed King Jesus. Amen and amen. Our final selection is Glorious Day. Glad it's up there.
justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, glorious day. Dear Christian, go forward with that encouraging word. He's coming. He's coming again for his people. And now receive his word of blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon you and in you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.